So again, good afternoon, everybody. My name is James Key Wallace, and I'm the executive director here at the Business Finance Authority. Um, this webinar is on the New Hampshire GAP Fund, which is the latest in the state's CARES Act allocation to provide relief dollars to small businesses and nonprofits. Um, so during this webinar, what we're going to do is give an overview of the program of you know, who's eligible to apply. Um, we'll answer your questions that you might have. We'll actually review the applications themselves to clarify what people might be asking by question A or question B. Um, we'll stop for questions along the way and have time at the end. Um, I'd like to introduce you to our um, moderator as well. You can see her on the screen. This is Tiffany Eddy. Um, she works with us here at the BFA and what she'll be doing is fielding your questions um, and accumulating them and then answer, you know, asking them of me and uh, we'll answer them as time goes on. Um, if you have questions, the way you would ask it is there's a button at the bottom of your Zoom screen that says Q&A. You would click that, type in your question and you know, she'll, she'll see it. Um, a couple housekeeping items before we get going. Um, this webinar is being recorded, uh, that way we can post it online as a resource for other individuals. Um, the webinar that we held on Friday is already posted online. Um, obviously, you, know, you aren't being recorded since you're not on the webinar, but, um, but we are and we just wanted to make sure that was disclosed. Um, you know, what I'd like to do before I get into the program itself is just answer what I find are kind of the three very quick top of mind questions that we get every single day, um, just to kind of get them out of the way. Um, you know, and the first is, you know, what is this gap fund for? You know, who are we trying to help with it? And the short answer is what we were asked to do is evaluate all the other programs the state's offering and look for situations where people were falling through the cracks. And the gap fund is designed to be flexible, you know, have a, a lot of different types of eligibility that can get you into the fund with, you know, discretion and flexibility about, you know, who we can help just to catch people from falling through the cracks. Uh, that, you know, it's for businesses, it's for certain types of nonprofits, and the amount of the fund is $30 million. Um, the second question is, how do we apply? And so we'll go right into that. Um, but the, the short, you know, answer again on that is you go to gopher, G-O-F, err.nh.gov. And we'll go there right now and we'll start reviewing the program. So I'm gonna share my screen with everybody. Here we go. Great. Uh, Tiffany, if you don't mind, can you confirm that my screen is visible? I can see your screen and um, just wanna let people know they are putting questions in the Q&A section. We will be getting to those. So uh, just want to let them know we will be answering some of those shortly. Great, okay. Um, so everybody, this is that website that I mentioned. You can see it right here, gofer.nh.gov. It's gofer.nh.gov. It's sort of the central hub for a lot of the state resources that are available due to COVID-19. Um, as well as, you know, information on certain meetings that are happening, announcements, news. It's, it's a kind of really all-encompassing site. Um, you should definitely, you know, check it out. Um, for our purposes today, you want to go to that website and look right here. The first thing you're going to see um, is the New Hampshire GAP Fund. So you just click on more information. And this brings you to the page that tells you what it's all about. So as you can see here, it was a $30 million fund to help businesses and nonprofits who were, you know, unable to get access uh, through other resources. Um, you know, some examples, for example, if, if you're a, a small business and you were a franchise, um, you were unable to be eligible for the Main Street Relief Program, but you are eligible for the GAP Fund. Uh, sometimes people's applications through no fault of their own were lost in cyberspace, it happens. Um, so if your application for Main Street Relief Fund was lost or there was a technical glitch or maybe a typo that prevented you from, you know, applying for relief dollars, the GAP Fund is another, another option for you. Um, you know, on the nonprofit side, there's an existing fund called the New Hampshire Emergency Relief Fund. That's for 501c3 nonprofits. As we know, there's lots of other kinds of nonprofits out there, 501c4s, 501c9s, 501c25s. Um, you know, we want to make sure resources are available, um, you know, at least for consideration for them as well. So 
if you're, let's start with the for-profit businesses. So I'd like to start with the um, eligibility criteria so we know what, what it is. You need to be a for-profit business, obviously. You need to have at least one employee other than the owner. So if you are the only employee in your business, and we define employee as someone who is a W-2 employees, employee, a 1099 contractor for this purpose does not count as an employee. So you need to have yourself and at least one other. You know, if you have, if that's your situation, then you are eligible. If you are the only employee of your business, then you um, should have applied to what's known as the self fund, which is a special relief fund for self-employed individuals. Um, that, that fund is already, um, you know, come and, come and gone. The business needs to have its principal place of business in New Hampshire. If you have businesses in multiple states, and that's common, or multiple locations, um, as long as the principal place of business, the activity, the jobs, what you're doing is here in New Hampshire, you're fine. Um, you know, contingent on the relief dollars you're applying for need to be spent in New Hampshire on the New Hampshire business. So if you have one in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, that's okay. Just you're applying on behalf of the New Hampshire location and the money is spent in New Hampshire. You have to have been fully operational prior to March 13th, 2020. That's the beginning of the stay at home order and you know, kind of the official um, kickoff a lot of, of a lot of the stuff from a governmental perspective. Um, so as long as you were in business and fully operational prior to that date, you are eligible to apply. Your business can't be in bankruptcy and you can't be permanently closed as a business. So it, you can be temporarily closed, you know, I think a lot of businesses might be, but if you have plans to reopen, uh, then you are certainly eligible to apply. You need to be in good standing with the Secretary of State, you know, just done your annual, your annual paperwork. Um, there are some sole proprietors who um, maybe don't have to fill out a um, certificate of good standing every year. Um, if that's the case, you upload something a little different during the process, but we'll, we'll get to that. And of course, you need to have been affected by COVID-19. And the two ways that you can be affected as a business that for the purposes of these federal funds are you've spent money on COVID-19 related expenses. Think PPE, redoing how you do your work, remote work, you know, anything that you've actually spent money on to respond to this. Or the second category is you've experienced a drop in revenue due to COVID-19 and the related shutdowns. So if those things have happened to you and you meet this you know, other criteria, you're certainly eligible to, to apply. So what I'm gonna do there is I'm gonna pause very briefly for questions on the for-profit eligibility criteria, and then we'll move into the nonprofit. So Tiffany, if there are any questions to that, I'd be happy to take them. Yeah, sure, we have a couple different questions. One of them, um, I own 50% of my business, my spouse owns the other 50%. We have joint personal bank accounts. Should we complete two personal financial statements or one together? If we complete two, do we divide bank account balances in half? That's a great question. Um, as everyone will see later, <clears throat> for the business, the for-profit businesses, one of the documents you need to provide is a personal financial statement. For those that are filing jointly because they co-own a business, um, you can just put it all on one form. You don't need to divide it. And um, they want to know, will you be defining the quantifiable financial impact? Um, yes. I mean, when I say quantifiable, if you've spent money on COVID-19 related expenses, you should you know, be able to say it was this much money, right? And if you've experienced a loss in revenue, um, you should be able to articulate how much your revenue has decreased. That's what we mean by quantifiable. Um, one question deals with any possible glitches in the system. They're having difficulty moving to the second page despite all the fields being filled out. Um, and they've tried different browsers. So they want to know if there any, I know that um, Google Chrome tends to be a good one to use. Yeah, um, you know, well, I would say a couple things. So um, generally speaking, Internet Explorer um, seems to have problems that are well beyond the scope of anything we're talking about today. But um, you know, we recommend Google Chrome or Firefox um, seems to be very compatible with the application. Um, so that solves most technical problems. 
Um, I'd have to talk to this individual, Tiffany, to understand why they in particular can't move forward. But what I would say to anybody um, who's having technical problems, you can do two things. You can email us, and I'll share this up at the end, um, at info at nhbfa.com. That's sort of a helpline where someone will call you and help you through your issues. And you can also call us. Um, and you know our, our contact information will be shared after. Um, myself and the whole team here are ready to help people through technical issues that they're facing. Um, it's usually just one something very little simple that's escaping uh, someone's gaze and we can nail it down pretty quickly. Another question that came in, is the GAP Fund open to nonprofits that have received PPP? Um, yeah, the an short answer is yes. So um, the GAP Fund is does not exclude anybody for profit or nonprofit because you've received PPP, um, or it doesn't automatically exclude you because you've received other support. You know, we will ask, you know, how much support you received from other sources, and that, that will be taken into account when we look at uh, the amount of support you still might need. Um, you know, not, not everybody who's eligible to apply will be awarded a grant. It'll depend on your situation and, you know, how much other support you've already received. Okay. Is the money taxable? That's a great question for a tax accountant. Um, I mean, obviously for a nonprofit, that's, I don't think an issue. Um, for a for-profit business, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, we will uh, look back on it and try and post that information on our website. But I think ultimately, you know, for any business that asks me about a taxable question, I would say for you, don't trust anything you read on any website. <laughs> Ask your accountant. That's that's the most important thing. And uh, one more for right now. Does the revenue questions mean gross receipts, gross margin, or net income? So we'll get to that uh, when we're going through the application for folks who are wondering what that question's about. Um, but to answer that question, what we mean is is revenue, gross receipts, sales. So it's going to ask you, you know, if you were a restaurant, what were your sales for the year? That's what we mean by revenue, not profit, not margin just revenue. We do ask for profit information later on in the application. Okay, so let's move on to the non-profit eligibility criteria. So like I was saying earlier, this really is designed to be a gap fund. It's not designed to replicate the other programs that already exist or have existed uh, through the state, but to provide um, a secondary layer as a backup if something went wrong, or in the case of nonprofits, kind of complementary services. So for nonprofit organizations, any nonprofit, except for those that are 501c3, because those have their own separate 501c3 relief fund already, and 501c6, because the federal regulations don't allow CARES Act money to go toward 501c6 organizations. So, but any other nonprofit organization um, is eligible to apply. Um, they need to have their principal operations in New Hampshire, just like the business community would. You um, need to comply with IRS rules and regulations, as I'm sure you hopefully do. Um, this is an important one for nonprofits. You cannot have, your primary purpose of the organization cannot be lobbying or legislative advocacy. It's not to say you can't do some of that, but it can't be the primary purpose of the organization, and that's a federal regulation. Just like above, you need to be, can't be in bankruptcy, permanently closed, you've gotta be good in good standing, and you have to have been affected by COVID-19 in the same ways as we talked about for businesses. Either you've spent money, um, or you intend to spend money on COVID-19 related expenses, or you've experienced a drop in revenue from fundraising or program income uh, that you depend on to support uh, your, your nonprofit's mission. Um, you know, I should say for nonprofits that, um, you know, prioritization is being given to organizations that are directly responding to issues related to the pandemic or working with vulnerable uh, populations that are most vulnerable in New Hampshire um, or who have a particular impact on the state's kind of economic health as well. So that's the nonprofit eligibility. Um, I, you know, for all groups, you know, like I said, receipt of funds from other sources is not an automatic disqualification, but it just gets taken into account 
when we look at these flex funds. So I'll pause there just to see if there are any questions, Tiffany, on the, the nonprofit side. On the nonprofit side, there's a lot of still on the for-profit side. Sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll get, we can get back to those. Yeah. So I'm looking through. So it says not a 501c3, meaning if we are a 501c3, we are not eligible. If you are a 501c3, you are not eligible. That's correct. Okay, most of these appear to be more for the profit side. I'm just going through the chat section. Sure. Um, my business is a 501c6, 501, 501c6, excuse me. We were left out of earlier programs are we unable to take advantage of the GAP Fund too? That's correct. 501c6 organizations are not eligible for the GAP Fund. It's a federal requirement, as it's told to me. Um, so, no, unfortunately, 501c6 organizations are not eligible. Are municipal entities eligible to apply, uh, like schools? Um, I, no, I don't believe so. That's a very good question. Um, I believe there's significant other pockets of state aid that are really specific to schools. Um, and I think those resources really are uh, what you should be looking to. Um, now, as a blanket statement, you know, I never want to discourage someone from applying because you know, if someone applies, and even if they're not eligible for the fund, at least now we would have documentation of what potential unmet needs you might have. And that can be taken into consideration um, as we you know, do plans going forward. So just because you might hear me say you're not eligible, you know, don't, don't take that as you shouldn't apply. You, you may want to consider just for documenting you know, what your need is, as long as your expectations are, you know, are appropriately set. And a couple questions about being a 501c3 um, who this uh, particular person, they were excluded from emergency relief for nonprofits because um, they bill for clinical mental health services. So they weren't able to get any um, CARES funds. And so they want to know if they could actually apply here. Um, you're certainly welcome to apply at the moment. You know, 501c3s are not, are not eligible. Um, I do believe there was a medical kind of specific fund set up. I, I don't know the status of that. I, it's probably come and gone at this point. Um, I think it was one of the first funds that were launched. Um, but again, you know, although C3s are not eligible for the GAP fund, I would encourage you to apply so we can, at a minimum, document you know what your needs might be. Okay. Okay. So continue on with some housekeeping. Um, important dates in the timeline. So the application period runs until August fourth. Um, that's about a week. So we're about halfway through it. Um, so you've, you know, got about a week to commit these, submit these applications. Um, they have to be submitted through the system. Um, folks have asked if they can mail them in or phone them in. They can't. It has to kind of go through one centralized system. And, and that's the, the period to apply. And then there'll be a verification period for just, just under two weeks. Um, that's where we're, you know, verifying identity, um, processing the applications and letting folks know if they've uh, received a relief grant or not. Um, we're all on the webinar today. If you're on this website and want to re-watch it, um, you can watch, you know, this one was the one from last Friday and then today's will be listed here uh, within a day or two of, of this concluding. So um, the things you want to note if you want to get started on the application. So once you go to this page, this is the link you're going to click to get started. But before you do, you'll have a second chance to do this, but it's easy here. If you're a nonprofit, download this COVID-19 worksheet and save it. If you're a for-profit, download this personal financial statement template and save it. You're going to need to fill those out as part of the application. It's just easier if you snag them now. Okay, so you click this link and um, you would, these are all the funds that are available through um, the state of New Hampshire at the moment. Um, the ones we're talking about here today are the New Hampshire Gap Fund for for-profits and nonprofits. So we're going to start with the, the for-profits. So you click on that link and it tells you a little bit about it. You get another chance to download that personal financial statement and then you would click apply online. 
So this is going to bring you to the screen. So what you want to do is if it's your first time, you would click create an account and it's simply going to prompt you for um, the name of your company, your address, city, zip, your name, phone number, and make a password. So you just do that once. It's very easy. Um, I'm not going to do it here because I already have one. Um, so then you, what you would do, and this is a, a common technical hang up for folks. I want to make sure people get it. So you use your email that you use to sign up. And my email is this. Anyone can email me anytime. But um, when you're coming back to sign in, the system, because it's a grant portal, requires you to put your email in like this and then add on to it dot egrants. Okay. When you sign up, you're going to get an email that shows you your login name. The dot egrants is listed there, but when you go to type it in, just, just don't forget that because that's a common, common misstep in the beginning. And then you would put in your password. And now you're at the screen. So these are all my dummy, uh, you know, accounts. You can ignore those. So if it's for your first time, what you would do is you click create new submission. Anytime before you hit the final submit button, you're, you can revisit and change your application to, by hitting the view button. I'm sorry, the edit button. And if you have an application you've already submitted, you can come back and you want to look at it, click the view button. You can't edit it after you've hit that final submit. You, you can edit it before that, but once you hit that final submit, you're only going to see view and you can't change it. But hope is not lost. If you really want to change something, you can make a new one. You, you know, you have to start over and take a couple extra minutes but then we will see them in order like we do here and we'll take your most recent, recent one. So starting a new one, you'd click create new submission. The first thing you do is, this is step one, you see the steps are on here, you can kind of bounce around the steps, um, but go in order. You have to add a contact and the contact is you probably. If it's you, you're the owner or on behalf of the business, for example, for a nonprofit business, I'll just say I'm the owner, and I'm not gonna type this all in individually. Um, you would just fill this out. Name, title, email, phone number. Right. Um, put in your either your EIN or social security number, your choice, the data is masked. Um, we use it on our end for identity verification, but you know you can see no one will see it. Um, if you have a different mailing address, you click here and just let it know. So you hit save. Now you as an individual are in the system and you're good to go. So this brings you to where you talk about your, um, your business. And so I'm gonna start going through these questions, but um, to think I figured I'd pause. I know I've been seeing some questions come in Make sure to use the Q&A uh, folks if you have any questions. Uh, so some questions that have come in uh, for the for-profit eligibility, this person, they're the 100% owner, but their wife is also a full-time employee. Do they still qualify? Yes, as long as um, you know your wife receives a W-2 from the organization, and she, so as long as there's you plus at least one other employee who receives W-2, you are eligible. Would a franchisee owning four separate businesses be potentially eligible? Yes, definitely eligible. Uh, filing for my business, why do I need to submit a personal financial statement? Yep, good question. Um, there's two reasons. Um, one of the big reasons is some of that information is used to do identity verification, which is uh, very important in the process to help prevent fraud. Um, and the other is that these are limited funds and they're going to be directed toward the areas uh, of highest need. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that everybody who, you know, happens to have some resources is going to be denied. You know, I wouldn't think that way. Um, but, you know, again, we do want to make sure this is going to where it has the most impact. If I got a uh, previous state funding, am I still eligible? You are eligible. Um, you know, we would look at your situation. If, if you've received your, you know, you know, kind of pro rata share of Main Street Relief, for example, that everybody else got, um, you're much less likely to get funded out of the GAP fund, you know, 
quite, quite frankly, because you know you haven't necessarily fallen into a gap. Um, it's really designed to be for the folks who you know got the wrong amount or couldn't apply or had some kind of issue, um, or there's just some really odd, you know, extenuating circumstances that prevented them from accessing these resources. Another question, do all stockholders of a corporation have to fill out individual financial forms? Um, yes, is the, is the short answer to that. If it's a publicly traded organization, that wouldn't be possible. Um, but if it's a privately held corporation, the answer is yes. This person owns five businesses and wants to know if they have to apply for each business separately. You do not. Um, you know, we, you'll, we'll go, when we go through the application, you'll see the, um, it's, there's areas for people who own multiple businesses to fill information out. And is there a formula for the amount to request? How is the award uh, amount determined? Um, you'll see later in the application that there is an amount, uh, an area where you can say how much are you requesting. That's really just for informational purposes. It doesn't necessarily have a bearing on, you know, how much you might receive. It just lets us know, hey, you know, here's how much I think I need and here's what I would use it for. Um, it's not necessarily formula driven. Um, if it was, we would end up producing the same thing that the Main Street Relief Fund did, um, which did a great job. It's just this is designed to be something different. Once the application is received, how long before they will find out if it's approved? About two weeks. Um, someone wants to know if there's a, how long they can be on there. They were filling out a form and they got timed out. So they want to know if there's any sort of timing parameters. Yes, thank you. I'm very glad you asked that question. So um, yes, there is a, for security reasons, a 15 minute timer on this, on, on this page, actually all these pages. So what you want to do, I'm a little paranoid, I like to do it anyway. Every 10 minutes you know, or so, scroll down to the bottom and just click save. What that will do is that will save all the information you've already put into the form and it kind of resets that timer so you won't, you won't lose anything. Um, it can be frustrating to have gone for 15 minutes and then lose that information and have to do it again. So make sure you hit save. Another person wants to know if they received an EIDL loan, will this affect their eligibility for this program? They are eligible to apply. Um, it does not disqualify them. Like any other you know, support they've received, it just is taken into account when we look at what the need is versus how much support they've already obtained. Okay, and then another one on the application, it says that they are, um, the application asks for projected profit loss for 2020. How do they indicate type of loss because there's no characters besides numbers that can be typed? Um, I will get to that. Um, you can hit the minus button to put a negative number up. So maybe what I'd, I'd like to do now then is I'll start going through the application because these are kind of, I think, application specific questions. So, okay. So the first section that you come to for the for-profit and uh, for, your, for the nonprofit folks on, on the webinar, um, a lot of these questions are very similar. We, we will do yours as well, but um, you know, this, this mostly applies to you too. So for for-profits though, he says, are you a for-profit organization? Yes or no? Sure. Is your business a franchise? For me, I'll say yes. Do you own multiples? Yes. Um, does your franchise agreement require you to share a percentage of revenue with the franchise or this is important. Um, the federal requirements are that the recipient of the grant be the, the only user of the grant. So if your franchise or requires you to give them a cut of any revenue you receive, um, you know, including this grant, you know, you can't do that. We have not heard of a case where a franchise or um, has refused to waive that, you know, so in other words, if you're a franchisee and you normally have to share a percentage with your franchisor, the franchisors are waiving that requirement. I have not heard of a, someone denying that. So we would just need to see that if that's the case. Was your business formed prior to March 13, 2020? Uh, yes. These are just the criteria from that first page. Are you in New Hampshire? Are you the only owner? Are you, as the owner, the only employee? No. Are you in bankruptcy? No. Are you closed forever? No. Do you file a tax return? Yes. You need one to apply. Do you lobby as your primary purpose? No. 
federal requirements are that you have a non-discrimination policy in place. We don't uh, need to see it, but if you don't have one, you can get one. Um, here's a sample one. We think it happens to be good, but you know, choose whatever one you think works for you. And are you in good standing with the Secretary of State? Yes. And again, if you're a sole proprietor, certain types of sole proprietors don't need to, to do that with the Secretary of State. Um, you would just click yes in that case. And then you would just start entering your, your information. And I will just go through this very quickly. Right. Um, we'll say I'm at 2 Pillsbury Street. This is our BFA address. Fill out your address information. Um, this is, oh, I'm, I apologize. No, this is the business owner's home address. Um, you know, make sure you do that. That's part of the identity verification uh, process. Um, do you own multiple businesses? I'll say no. For those of you that say yes, that's fine. Um, this is where you start entering information for multiple businesses. So you would put James's house of, uh, we'll say pancakes. Um, right, and you just put your tax ID in there, whatever it is. And if you had a second business, you would put the name here. Generally, if something doesn't apply to you, just put NA or zero. So for me, I'll say that's my only business. If you had multiple, you'd fill these in. Um, this asks you if you own more than three. We didn't want to have to make people answer this 10, you know, these questions 10 times. If you have more than three, just click yes. We'll call you or email you and just ask you to send us the same information uh, via an email and we'll append it to your app. And then it says, you know, does anyone else own other parts of your business? Yes or no? And I'll say yes in my case. Um, we'll say Tiffany here owns, you know, 51% of the business. Um, so, you know, if you have other owners, you would just list their names and percentages. Um, this is the employment section. Again, this is for business one. That's the one you put at the top. Um, how many full-time businesses do you employ, including yourself? Now, this includes folks who've been recently laid off, furloughed, you know, anything like that. So it doesn't necessarily mean just today, but uh, normally speaking, how many folks do you employ? Let's say we have 25 full-time and 15 part-time. You would repeat these answers for business two and three if you have them. Some people get a little intimidated when they see this application because it looks a little long. The reason it looks long is it's actually repeated three times because of the three businesses. So when it's just one business, it actually goes very quickly. All right, before I go to the next section, uh, Tiffany, I see there may be some additional questions. So one question, as I gather my financial information, should I use 2019 information or should I use second quarter 2020? We are going to ask for both, so get both. Okay. Does being an LLC make any difference in eligibility? No. When business owned by three people, does each owner submit a personal financial statement? Yes. Um, this one, and this, I think we've had a couple with husband and wives, but if the owners are my wife and myself, is that one or two owners? Um, if it's your wife and yourself and you're, you are both in the name of the business as owners, you would list yourself and your spouse and, you know, who owns what percentage. If it's 50-50 because it just is a joint asset, then you would put 50-50. Do um, employees include independent contractors? No, they do not. It has to be w 2 employees. So do not include 1099 employees. Good question. Okay, and so a 1099 employee is not considered, could you clarify, is a 1099 employee considered an employee? And a, 10, a 1099 contractor, which is what we mean by that, a 1099 person is not considered an employee. Only folks who receive a W-2 from your business count for this purpose. If you are part owner of multiple businesses but are only applying for one business and your other partners are applying for other businesses, do you say yes to multiple businesses? I know that's a complex one. 
The answer is yes, you do. Yes, you do. You list everything that you own in full or part. Um, later on, you'll see there's, you know, how much are you, are you applying for for business one? You might put something in there and it asks how much are you applying for for business two and three? It, it could be zero. And your, your the other owners of that business may be applying for those businesses and they would fill in the request on their application. Is one part-time employee plus owner okay? As long as they receive a W-2, yep. Is there a PDF fill-in version of the personal financial statement? Nope, nope. Uh, question 5B, business tax ID from Schedule C or Social Security number or EIN is, I guess, they want to know which one's the best one to use. Federal, federal tax ID, federal. Yep. We capture your EIN or social on that previous page, and actually your social gets captured right here. So. Uh, what if the owner or the individual filling out the application lives out of state but is applying on behalf of a business that has its principal place of business in New Hampshire or conducts a significant portion of its operations here in New Hampshire? That is fine. Um, as long as the business is operating in New Hampshire, with New Hampshire employees and the relief funds, if awarded, are spent on that New Hampshire location, that's fine. Okay, looks like some of these are um, repetitive, so I think we can move forward and I'll keep going through the questions. Great, okay. Um, so this is where you start to enter what you've received um, already for support for the business. It's broken out by business one, two, and three, in case you have more than one. So you just fill in what you've received in the past. Um, so if you had a paycheck protection loan, PPP, you know, you could put that in here. If it's zero, you just put zero. You know, if you receive something else from another state fund, you know, you could fill that in. If not, put zero and select none. We'll say this person did receive something. And maybe there was an error, so they only received $7. Disaster loan, you just, you know, you just fill this out. Any other federal source, where was it? You would answer the question, you know, just answer as appropriate. If you have plans to apply for additional help from somewhere else or a pending application, you would say that. Um, for me, I'll say that I don't. And I, you know, how much you're asking for from those other sources, the answer for me would be zero. And this is where you enter your financial information for business number one. So someone asks about, you know, revenue, what was meant by that, gross receipts. We mean sales revenue, just top line, no deductions, you know, whatever it is, right? So in 2019, based on your tax return, you just enter the number. And then what do you think you'll do for revenue for 2020? We know it's a projection. Uh, COVID-19 has proven to be very unpredictable, as we all know. Um, but, you know, do your best based on what you've experienced to date and what you think is going to happen. Um, this was a, a, a a mis misstep that happened for some folks under the Main Street Relief Program, where they put in um, their original projections, like in January, here's what I thought I was gonna do for 2020. Don't do that, put in today, your best thinking today, where you're going to think you're gonna end up for revenue at the end of 2020. So let's say I'm down, I think I'm gonna be at 75,000 in revenue instead of 125,000. Here you would list anything you've spent on COVID-19 specific expenses, PPE, reconfiguring your workspace, remote working, whatever it might be. Let's say it's that much, and then you describe what it is. PPE, okay. If it's zero, just put zero. What do you plan to spend on PPE or COVID-19 expenses for the rest of the year? Again, if it's zero, you can put zero. And here's the question where someone said, how do you indicate a negative number? think is going to happen for 2020. Let's say I, I either, if you think you're going to have a small profit or a profit, you would put in say 15,000 if that's what I think. Um, if my business is going to have a loss in 2020, I think, you just put negative. And let's say I'm going to lose um, 12,000. And there it is. You know, one thing that sometimes tri trips people up, if you look at your keyboard, um, the thing that we learn, uh, you know, if you use the number pad, 
I want to just go ahead and show you. Um, if you use the number pad here, that actually often doesn't work. Um, and what you want to do is push the minus, because that's actually a dash, I guess. But um, you want to put, you want to push the one that's next to your like one, two, three, you know, right here, um, over there. And that will get the negative number in there, no problem. So try that. We get uh, a, a lot of calls about that one, actually. Um, then it just asks about compensation, you know, you know how, if it's helpful for us to know how much of your compensation depends on the success of your business. Um, let's say I paid myself 35,000, myself and my family last year. Uh, unfortunately, this year I've you know, taken a dip. So that would be that part. And then you enter, you know, how much you're requesting from the gap fund. Again, this doesn't affect how much you're going to receive, but it's helpful for us to know um, how much you think you might need and um, you know, what you, what you would spend it on. Um, so we'll say rent, taxes, um, we'll say mortgage, um, and payroll, and a little PPE. And then you, um, you know, say who's, who's responsible for this. We'll just say I am. Okay. Um, we're not going to micromanage how you spend the money. It has to be spent, obviously, on legitimate business expenses, you know, covering COVID-19 costs or replacing some lost revenue. Um, but we're not here to micromanage how you spend the money. The next two sections, I'm just going to breeze through because it's literally the same questions we just filled out. It's just repeated for um, business two and business three. So while I'm doing that, Tiffany, um, I don't know if there are, oh, I just got a little warning. It's about to time out, so I will hit save. Watch out for that. Um, so I wanna go back down to where I was. So Tiffany, I don't know if um, you wanna answer questions. I can try and multitask here. Absolutely, and I'm trying to get to the ones that are more uh, general so that um, hopefully other people might have the same questions and the ones that are super specific, uh, we will, uh, we have your email and we can reach out to you afterwards to try to help you with your, your specific questions. Um, this one says on the documents, it says, you need to upload your certificate of formation or your articles of incorporation from the Secretary of State's office. I only seem to have a certificate of authority. Is that the same thing or will it be sufficient to submit? Um, if not, where can I get the required document? You should be able to get any of your Secretary of State doc documents from the Secretary of State, um, whether it's certificate of formation or your original incorporation documents. That's all on file, Secretary of State. Um, if for some reason you you know, have gone there, they, they've said that that's all we have, contact us and we'll, we'll see what we can do. Can you re-clarify what should be used in the tax ID field? It should be your federal, um, just so everyone sees it, right here, up at the top, name of the business, tax ID of the business, your federal tax ID, which should be on your return, tax return. We okay. need to be, do we need to be in good standing with the meals and room tax? Um, I guess not legally, um, no. No, I, I have to examine what, what that situation is, um, but it's not gonna prevent you from applying. If you have not filled out your 2019 federal tax return, can you still apply? You can, um, we would prefer that you have done that. But if you, if you are um, legitimately on extension, you can upload your extension paperwork into the 2019 tax return box instead of the tax return itself. Another question, I am on a fiscal year end of 1130. Do I use those numbers from 1130 2019 or do I need to report calendar year numbers? Do whatever lines up with your tax reporting schedule. Is there a maximum funding amount? Um, not technically, um, but you know, this, this fund is less than one tenth of the size of the Main Street Relief Fund. Um, and so, you know, it will in part depend on how many folks apply and what the need is, um, but we're not setting currently minimums and maximums. It's gonna depend on what we receive once we see it. Uh, an anonymous person wants to know, you mentioned some questions we should contact you. What's the best way to do that? The very best way is to email info at nh 
bfa.com. I'll just type it here for the moment. Info at nhbfa.com. That goes right to our central hub where everyone here is trained to answer specific questions. Um, we have a system where we're kind of spreading the load and making sure everyone gets a very quick response. Very happy to say that is happening and people are getting helped. So go ahead and, and email that uh, email address. If you need something else, you can call us as well, though email actually gets a quicker response because it goes into the system. Um, and chances are people are on the phone with someone else already, but you can call us at 603-415-0190. Another question, after we submit all required documentation and you find um, in the review that something's missing, will you reach out to us for further information? Yes, we will. Now, the um, application itself won't let you submit without having uploaded everything, so it's unlikely that that could happen, but if we need clarification on something, we will be reaching out to people. Uh, my tax return does not have all the information the personal financial statement is asking for. Can I fill in the information based on bank statements, etc.? Yeah, exactly. That, and that's very common. You know, when you fill out a personal financial statement, typically your tax return doesn't provide all the information. Yeah. So you would use, you know, it's going to ask you just, you know, what are the things you own? What are the things you owe? And you just list them. And again, there's a, a lot of questions on personal financial statements. My partner and I are 50-50 owners. Do we both need to submit a personal financial statement? No, you can file a joint well, when you say partner, I don't know if you mean your spouse or life partner or your business partner. If it's your household partner, you can file a joint statement. If it's a business partner and, you know, there's someone else, um, you each own part of the business. Yes, you each need to fill out a personal financial statement. Along with the application, what documentation is actually required? A copy of the tax return? Uh, actually, that's the next screen on here. So why don't we move on to that? So um, I just, as you saw, I just fill out zeros for the two businesses. So once you're done with this first top section, if you own one business, you're you're done. This is this is most of it. So it's not not too bad. You would just click continue, and you would get to the document upload section. And this is where we ask you to upload the documents that corroborate a lot of the information you entered in. Um, for example, here, you know, for, for business number one, um, which is the business people typically are using to apply with, please upload your 2018 internal financial statements. If you have an audit or review from an accountant, that's great. If not, that's fine. Your QuickBooks, whatever it is, that's fine. Just upload your financial statements. This is not your tax return. That comes a little later. Um, if your business didn't exist in 2018, because maybe you're newer than that, just give us your most recent financial statements. And then again, ditto, give us your 2019 year-end statements. And if you didn't exist in 2019, just give us your most recent statements. And the way you upload these is you just click, choose a file. It's just gonna bring you to your computer's file and you just pick it and it's that easy. So I'm just gonna go ahead and these are just empty files, but um, the next one is, please upload your businesses, this is your businesses, not your personal tax return, your um, 2019 tax return. If you're a sole proprietor and your income is on the Schedule C, for example, then you would put all that here. But if it's a separate tax return, put your business's federal return right here. And again, if you didn't exist in 2019, um, you wouldn't, you would just upload your most recent statements. If you're on extension for 2019, upload your extension paperwork. Here, just give us your year to date financial statements. It asks for profit and loss, balance sheet and cash flow. That's in an ideal world. If you don't have all those documents, it's fine. Um, just give us whatever it is you have about how you're doing so far in 2020, your QuickBooks, Excel, whatever it is. Here we want the projections. So this is, how are you doing so far this year? How, you, how do you think you're gonna do for the rest of the year? You know, we get all sorts of formats from these from very detailed things to literally handwritten, you know, people do projections by hand. 
Um, any of that's fine as long as it's based in reality for your business. So just do your best and uh, upload your, your projections. And then here are um, where you'd upload your certificate of good standing. Um, if you don't have one because you're not required to, to, to file one, you know, that's fine. Um, what you would do, you know, some sole proprietors don't have to actually get certificates of good standing from the Secretary of State. If that is your case, upload your state of New Hampshire tax return. You know, this is our way of verifying that your business has, you know, done what it needs to do to continue to duly exist, um, for lack of a better word. So if you don't have a certificate of good standing, because you don't need one, upload your state of New Hampshire tax return. Otherwise, just get a certificate, it's very easy. Secretary of State's great, and upload. Um, here, this is where you upload that personal financial statement um, that we talked about. You do that. And then this is the, the, the information someone asked about. This is your certificate of formation, sometimes known as an article of incorporation, depending on whether you're an LLC or a C Corp. Um, if you have that, you know, Upload it if you aren't required to have had one again because you're a sole proprietor. You don't need to do that. Just um, upload, you know, your again. You can upload your tax return again. That's re that's required because this is going to confirm when your business came into existence. Optional documents. These are not required to proceed. These are all the same questions, just for business two and business three. One thing that is different. Um, we couldn't put this in the required documents because it doesn't apply to anybody, but for franchises, it is required. So if you happen to be a franchise and are listening, please upload this. If you don't, we'll just come back to you and ask for it. But you know, if you, if you don't mind, please do right here. Um, you know, upload a copy of your franchise agreement if you happen to be a franchise. It's not gonna prevent you from moving forward, but it would be helpful. So, uh, I'll pause on that document section, Tiffany, and ask for questions. Sure. Uh, on the personal financial statement, it asks for salary. Is that the current salary, 2019 salary, um, or should we be filling out the personal financial statement with 2019 or 2020 info? You should fill out the personal financial statement with you know, the latest information. So, you know, what you get paid now, what assets and liabilities you have now, um, you know, I mean, obviously, if you're looking at your bank statement, you're not going to get today's, you're going to get the end of the month from last month. That's fine. Um, just put the most recent information you have available. What if we filed a 2019 federal tax return extension? You would upload that um, where it asks for the 2019 tax return. You would upload your extension paperwork in lieu of the 2019 return. Any suggestions for projection requirements for businesses without accounting software? Um, you know, my best um, piece of advice for that actually is probably to try and get some help from someone who helps businesses make projections. There are a lot of great free resources, including um, the Small Business Development Center, um, or known as the SBDC. They have offices all around the state and help um, companies with technical assistance, including making projections. Um, if they don't have time to turn something around for you for this, I, I can imagine that might be a little tough because then, you know, there's only a week left. You know, you're not going to put a new piece of software in your business to make projections. Just do your best, whether it's Excel by hand, use whatever you have. By financial statement, is a one page annual summary sufficient? Um, it depends on the business. If it contains all the information, you know, about how you did that year, then sure. Uh, question number seven asks for other owners' names. I'm the only owner. What do I do? Just write my name for them 100%. So just uh, one name, correct? So earlier it, it says, are there other owners? It says yes or no, you click no. And it says, if there are other owners, list their names. You would put NA because there aren't any other owners. Um, Someone wants to know if um, this information will be potentially subject to public disclosure. That is a great question. We're, we're still trying to figure that out. So transparency is very important. 
um, you know, anyone who receives a grant, um, any business or nonprofit from these flex funds, their name and location will be listed just as they have been for every other program. Um, in my um, thinking, I, I would be doubtful that the individual applicant's information would be subject to public disclosure. You know, confidential, personal, financial information or business, you know, for the business finance authority in general, when we receive those applications, none of that is publicly disclosable. We're still trying to ensure that that's the case <clears throat> for this. Um, you know, if that's a concern of yours, you know, hold back um, by all means, but we will have an answer to that very shortly. Uh, this person wants to know what the personal financial statement is. They are a sole proprietor in file Schedule C. Um, they, maybe they missed it earlier. It's um, a document that's available on um, the Gopher website and in part of this application, there's a couple places to click to it. It's a document that you fill out that just lists your personal assets and liabilities. Okay, and then, um, so a lot of questions on the financial statement. Uh, what is the financial statement? A couple of those are repeat questions. Another one, if I have received a PPP loan, Main Street funds, and um, an EDIL loan, am I still eligible for this grant loan? So um, the answer is yes. These are all grants. Um, they're not loans. Um, receiving other support will be taken into account when we consider, you know, how much, if any, awards, relief awards are given, um, but it does not prevent you from applying. Um, so, Tiffany, what I'd like to do, I know we're getting close to three o'clock. I want to make sure that um, I get to the nonprofit side of things and just highlight the differences for that group. Okay. Um, so, but to, to round this out, and again, if people have questions, reach out to us. We'll, we will answer your individual questions. Um, you hit continue. You get a chance to review all this information to make sure it's right. If you don't think it's right, you can click back on here and go back a few steps and fix it. Um, if you think it's right, you read the agreement, um, you know, read this carefully, and then you would sign it. Right, and you would hit continue. And this would bring you to the final step where you hit submit. Submit locks it in. So if you don't hit submit, it's still in the system. You can come back, log in, and edit it. Um, but once you hit submit, it locks it in. And you, know, you have to hit submit or else you haven't actually applied. So when you are fully ready, hit submit. You'll get this green little form and you're good. So what I'd like to do now is very quickly go to the nonprofit page. I'm just gonna start over and go to the same place. There you go to the website, you go to apply. In this case, you'd click the nonprofit link. Again, remember to download this worksheet. I'm gonna quickly download it to hold it steady. You click apply online. You make an account if you don't have one. You log in. And I'm just going to um, maybe view, I'll just make a new one. So it's the same thing. You just make a new one. You add yourself as a contact. You guys have seen this before. Um, you know, I'm just going to breeze through this. Um, okay. okay. So once you make a contact, you move on and continue to the application. Very similar questions. Are you a nonprofit? Yes or no. Do you file a tax return? Yes or no. Do you conduct charitable activities? Yes or no. Obviously priorities, giving to those who are having the most impact from a charitable perspective um, and those that are having economic impact on the state. Um, if you do charitable activities, you're supposed to file with the charitable trust unit, so you would click yes. Is the primary purpose of your organization lobbying or advocacy? answer if you want to be eligible needs to be no and obviously we'll know if it is um, same questions discrimination policy yes or no good standing certificates and here's where you pick your organizational type remember that 501c3 
and C6 are not eligible for the CARES Act funding from, the, from this particular fund. And C6s are not eligible from, from any fund. And then you would just fill out the information, right? So we'll just, uh, we'll just fill it all out this way. Say it's my organization, you know, let's say I have, we're pretty, you know, um, mean, mean team, let's say we have uh, 12 people, two part-timers, again, W2 employees, not 1099s, that's who you include here. And then you um, are gonna answer some questions about your expenses and your revenue projections, whether it was fundraising disruptions or other things like that. And the way you do this is by completing that worksheet, which I clicked on earlier. You have another chance to download it here. So I'm gonna very briefly um, review that just to make sure there are no questions from the nonprofit um, teams out there. So this is the spreadsheet that links to it. It has two tabs on it. Tab one here is the kind of expense tab, like you know, how much have you spent? And then, you know, the second tab is how much revenue do you think you've not obtained from canceled fundraisers and things like that? So you want to fill both of these out. You're going to have to upload it at the end, but also this gives you the answers to some of the questions in the application. The blue cells are the ones you fill in. The gray are the um, automatic formulas. So you would fill in your organization's name. And this asks you between March 1 and June 30, you know, actual expenses. And this one is, you know, well now it's July, but you know, kind of projected future expenses. And here you would just list how much you've spent on things in these categories. These are just examples. You can fill in whatever it is, whatever you want, as long as it's COVID-19 related. If you don't see what you have spent, you know, your category, just, just type something in. And we'll say I spent 5,000, oops, gotta click this button, um, 5,000 on PPE and um, 2,500 on remote working equipment. And I expect to spend another 2,500 on PPE, okay? So these are kind of internal needs to the organization. And then, you know, what have you spent on the public, the, the members that you serve? Right. You know, are you providing food, shelter, cleaning supplies, technology for them, new programs, whatever it might be, you would fill in, um, you know, how much you've spent on COVID-19 specific expenses. And you would uh, obviously know all this information. And uh, you can, oops. You can um, add notes if you want. So that's gonna give you these two numbers. This is what you have spent. This is what you think you're going to spend. So then on the application itself, it says between March 1st and June 30, what did you spend? And you would just take this number and fill it in and describe it. You know, it's in that sheet, so it'd be easy. Um, I won't, please do describe it at length. I won't do it here and then this is from um, the other worksheet. So let me go to the other side. So this is, what do you expect to lose from revenue opportunities? Let's say you hold a fundraising event that normally brings in $50,000 to your nonprofit. You would put that here. But actually it only brought in um, 3,000 because it was canceled, but some people still donated. Um, however, at the same time, maybe you, or let's say even say, let's say it brought in nothing. Right, just to keep it simple. At the same time, you didn't have to rent the venue or spend money on the food, et cetera. So let's say you avoided $10,000 of expenses for the fundraising event. What that means is, um, nope, hmm, that didn't actually, oh, hold on a second. All right, I'm gonna publish a new version of this. this is, uh, I apologize, guys, I'm not the, I think someone's changed this. I mean, um, this should do it for you. There we go. Ignore my Excel and confidence, please. Um, but so basically, however much um, you expected to bring in minus however much you didn't spend is how much the nonprofit lost kind of net for fundraising opportunities. So then you would, you would do the same thing. You would do the same thing here. 
you'd fill in those informations and you'd bring it right here. So, you know, between the dates of March and June 30, what was that net revenue loss? For, for my example, it was 40,000. And now projections, what do we think we're gonna spend on COVID-19 expenses for the rest of the year? You just pull it from that spreadsheet and um, you put that here. <clears throat> And then how much revenue do you think you're gonna lose from future events this year that aren't going to happen? And we'll say it was um, 25,000. And then here, just like businesses, you fill in how much you receive from other um, sources. PPP, for example, let's say it's none. Um, let's say you receive $5,000 from um, <clears throat> the New Hampshire um, healthcare system relief fund, right? You would just put what it is. If it's, if it's nothing, you would click none. And if you haven't received any info of these other awards or support from other sources, you just put zeros. Otherwise you, you fill in, you know, how much you've received and uh, describe them. It's asked you if you plan to ask for other support from other sources. If you do say yes and describe it, uh, we'll say FEMA, Relief fund, which as far as I know, I don't even know if that's a real thing. I'm making that up. It might be. Um, and how much are you applying for? And then how much are you requesting from the gap fund? What are you going to use it for? Telework, PPE, payroll. Um, and then these set next boxes, just describe your nonprofit. What do you do um, in your community? What needs are you meeting? If other groups are doing the same thing, talk about how you work together or how you're different. And then give examples of some of the work you do. Um, you know, quanti quantifying things is, all, is always really great. You know, we, we serve 500 meals a week. We do this, you know, we help 100 people a day apply for X. Um, that's always really helpful. <clears throat> Describe how you've been impacted by COVID-19 here. You know, what's happening in the nonprofit. You know, do you have a staff, a board, volunteers, paid staff? Just describe that here. Who is responsible for the financial oversight in your firm? Let's say it's the um, executive director and that controller. List the towns that you serve. Um, if it's statewide, just put statewide. If it's just Greater Concord, just put Greater Concord. And then, you know, what are the types of you know, audiences that you address? Maybe we work with um, veterans and their families, elderly individuals, and low-income families. Um, if you serve everybody, kind of broad public, you would just check that. And if it's other, you would check that, and you would specify that here. And then you move on, and you're pretty much done. Um, same type of document uploads tax returns, nonprofits get audited financial statements, reports to the charitable trust typically. Um, if you don't have one of these documents, um, call us and, and let us know. And then you're, you're done. You would do the same thing, you would hit continue, you know, you would hit that submit button at the end. So maybe I can stop there for, for final questions. Um, they want to know one question about the location of the nonprofit. If it's actually at uh, someone's home, should they use that as the address? Yeah, if that's where it's located. Sure. And another person wants to know, is there a list of required documents we can prepare before starting our application? It's right here. Yep. It's right here. And this Thank will be posted online and you can watch the one that's already posted online to come back to this. Do you anticipate any additional funding in the future? Um, you know, that's a really good question. I'm, I'm not the, probably the right person to ask. You know, um, I think there's a lot of talk in Washington about, you know, additional support for people, but it appears to be, um, you know, in the negotiation world in Washington. And um, it, in many ways, I'm lucky, very lucky not to be part of that. I wouldn't I wish that on my worst enemy, I think. Um, 
there's some other questions that are very specific. So I think uh, one of the best things to do is that we will go through all of these questions. And for those who had their names on, on them, uh, you know, we can email you the answers um, and we will be going through and posting this webinar and we will get questions. And again, um, we have info at nhbfa.com for specific questions. Great. Well, everybody, thank you very much. Um, in you know, to the nonprofits who are watching, thank you for you know accommodating sort of the rush through the you know application. Um, there were a lot of questions from the for-profit teams today. If you need anything, email us, as Tiffany said. Call us, and we're, we're happy to help. And that goes for everybody. Um, but thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to chatting with you if you have any questions. Yeah. Thank you.